Do you have any thoughts on, on the IVIS versus OCT um, commentary or, or debates that we hear just around calcium specifically? You know, I, I, I think both modalities can help um, assess. Uh, I would recommend, you know, you kind of need both available to help, um, you know, the osteum of uh, lesions are very hard to judge with OCT because you need contrast clearance. Um, there are tricky ways of getting around it using a guideliner, but you're going to get a lot more information of, about that with IVIS. The, the other part of it is sometimes with interventions, you need to go in with your IVIS or your intracoronary imaging devices multiple times. And when you do that, with OCT and use extra contrast, that, that can hurt you during your case. Um, but I think there's value to both scoring mechanisms using IVIS or OCT. Yeah, I think their pointers aren't that they're kind of like a flag being waved to say, you've got to do something, but it doesn't necessarily point you to exactly what. So you'll have to tip put a layer of interpretation on it to pick the next device that, that makes the most sense. I mean, from my perspective, uh, my experience, I think it can, can be a real faff and, and very tight lesions to get contrast clearance with OCT. Whereas with IBIS, the images are there for you and, and the other scenarios we've sort of discussed. And I think the actual thickness of the calcium is a bit superfluous in terms of uh, something that's informing us because the end point of what we have in terms of devices to um, modify the calcium isn't really changed by that measurement. Um, and as you've pointed out Umel, already, the um, reverberation artifacts are a really great pointer that something is probably balloon dilatable or maybe cutting balloon dilatable. And the Wolverine's a very effective device for a lot of those lesions. So you don't always have to resort to the crazily expensive technology. And I think another thing that, that I've seen, uh, we sort of got our hands on, on IVL back in 2018, is for the eccentric and nodular calcium, it, it's, it's losing all its energy out into the non-calcified areas. And it doesn't really do much to those lesions. Uh, and I think people need to discover that for themselves over time. But if that's the pattern in the vessel that we're dealing with, uh, that's unlikely to be the most effective technology that you can be uh, applying to it. Uh, it'll be expensive, won't do an awful lot, and it'll still leave you with the same problems probably afterwards. Uh, so it's uh, it's worth careful consideration. If we broaden out the discussion then, um, Ryan, the let's talk through the sort of common excuses people throw out in terms of why they, they don't think intravascular imaging has value. Uh, so what do you think about the argument around time and cost? Um, I guess my perspective is what the patient's getting out of that. Um, a few minutes or a few seconds even to get an IVIS run and get an ideal size of what their vessel is, is more important than just dropping a stent that you think, quote unquote, fits it angiographically. Um, so I think if that's the reason that you're not using IVIS is because of cost or time management, you're going to save a lot of time. I think in the long run, you're going to make the patient a lot happier knowing that their stent's appropriate for them. Yeah, it, well, it's, it's reimbursed and there's RVUs. Um, so, you know, and actually time, I think is, uh, it's the opposite. I think yeah. time is generally saved because you give yourself a roadmap for your, your PCI, uh, your, you understand what stent you want, you know where it's going to land, you know what post balloon you want. But if you follow that script, your, your procedure is actually very efficient. Um, so I, I, I think it's probably time saving paradoxically, okay, it takes a couple of minutes to put it together and put it in. But if you set the device up at the start of the case as a routine thing, that doesn't add anything. And actually to take a run, analyze it, you know, and, and do that before and after a stent, it's only a couple of minutes. And as you've pointed out, for the patient's long term, to spend an extra four or five minutes during a procedure to guarantee a, a five or 10 year PCI result, I think that's time that's very well spent. And if you're really obsessed with time, I mean, reduce your turnover between patients in the cath lab and focus your energy there uh, rather than the nonsense about, you know, not doing something that's going to make a, a patient better. Yeah. Uh, how about the, the argument around evidence? Uh, well, I think that, that ship has sailed, hasn't it? Yes, I think so. I think, I think you'd be foolish not to do it. Yeah, I think the evidence um, is we, we now have, when you count OCT as well as IVIS, You've got multiple randomized studies now showing improved uh, clinical outcomes. And so if we put patients first, regardless of time usage, I think we should use it. And like you said, with um, a higher influx of higher risk PCIs done, when you add it up, you're actually saving time in the cath lab.
Yeah. But I think, you know, no matter where we look, even if we go back to music in 1998, you know, and that was Ty Bailey's, and you still see that sort of 30% drop in, in TVR, uh, which it, it's amazing how consistent that sort of number has been across what, three decades nearly now. And um, all of the studies, all of the registries, everything points in the same direction. So I, I, I do find it difficult that, that people make an argument that they, they don't see a benefit to it. I mean, I suppose one of the other things that you'll hear from time to time is, oh, I've been doing this forever and, you know, my results are good. I mean, what, what do you say to people? How do you, how do you change their mind? You, you mentioned, Bill, that you've been trying to sort of uh, uh, persuade people that this is the way forward. How do you uh, go around that argument? Well, you know, we have a, a friendly bunch, let's say, here at Honor Health. And so, you know, the best way is just showing them right? You know, being in a case with them and then having a MIVIS and having them guess initially what they would, what size stent they would put in and, uh, you know, what they would post dilate with. Um, you know, I was lucky enough to train in a place where we routinely did intracoronary imaging. I'm still very surprised at what the vessel size is. So that's the easiest way. I think you, you let them do it. And then, then once they start realizing that, you know, they've been undersizing things for so long, um, uh, they change their practice. Yeah, I think the concept of a, a patient prosthesis mismatch is, is very well understood with valves. Um, who in their right mind is going to consider doing a, a, a TAVI without a CT scan? You know, it's just like it wouldn't happen. Yet we'll merely uh, misjudge and uh, undersize stents in the coronaries. And uh, again, to me, that it sort of boggles my mind. It, it doesn't make an awful, awful lot of sense. Um, I guess uh, another sort of thing to re-emphasize, particularly around sort of contrast usage and radiation, is that IVIS, I think, saves both. Rian, what's your experience there? Yeah, coming out of this whole contrast shortage now, too, I think people maybe realize that they don't need to take so many angios if they have the ability to use IVIS because... You're, you're finding your, your length of the plaque that you wanna treat, you're finding the distal and proximal diameters, um, and you're post dilating, and then you're relooking with IVIS to make sure everything looks good, and then you're taking your angio. So you can really minimize it down to maybe your uh, first guider picture and then final guider picture, and you could walk away from a pretty extensive fix with just using, what, 10 to 15 cc's of contrast with using IVIS appropriately. Yeah. I, I, I think getting people to understand that when you use intracoronary imaging and when you use IVIS, you're actually, it's, it's the equivalent of getting infinite number of angiograms, right? Because mm -hmm. you've got a 360 degree view. Yeah. So it's magic in that type of manner when you think of it that way. And when you get people to think about it like that, they start realizing, you know, using eight to 10 cc's for every different view, they're only getting a snippet of what's going on in the vessel. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, I mean, really the hazard that we uh, can't emphasize enough is the unrecognized calcium. Um, you know, we see that in, in Excel at, at Noble, we, when we did the core lab for Noble, uh, the, as the arcs increase, basically the stem areas decrease, and that's when you get to the lower tertiles and, and the adverse events increase. And our ability from angiographic views to, to recognize which bits of calcium are going to be problematic or uh, need treated, it's really a huge, huge underrepresentation, and we, we just don't understand from the angiogram alone. So I would really appeal to people to, to really consider carefully what they're doing within the coronary and to adopt very meticulous practice. It, it, from a pullback perspective, do you guys do manual or do you prefer to have the, the um, automated, the mechanized pullback? And, I like and, the automated because then I can get a real good idea of my stent length that I'm going to need. Yeah. 100% agree with that. You're not going to, otherwise it's a little bit more difficult. And once you get the lab kind of routinely being able to set things up efficiently, it, it you don't lose much time. I, I would argue it is a standard of care as well. Uh, and I think you can then increase how meticulous your PCI becomes. You can actually avoid stand over lab at large branches. You can make smarter decisions. And, you know, there's, there's a whole series of things that, that can be much better informed. And it doesn't take that much longer. It just gives you better information. So if you're doing it, why, you know, why, why would you sort of leave stuff on the table? It doesn't, it doesn't make an awful, an awful lot of sense to me. Well, I think that's, uh, that's been a, a great, uh, great session, some fantastic cases. Um, 
hopefully we, we've persuaded people that there's definitely utility to intravascular imaging and IVUS in particular. Uh, I personally think that we are moving towards a standard of care uh, for patients and that this should be a big part of it. Uh, and I'd love to see our, our PCI PLC sort of uh, broader specialty move towards that sort of uh, step. I mean, maybe as a finishing thought, how would you sort of advocate for that or what would you say to people in terms of standardizing our outcomes with PCI? You know, I, I'm a strong proponent of making it easier for people to adopt it. So I think this whole idea of, um, you know, IVIS one, two, three, you know, going through pre-stent, choosing your, your, your equipment and your post-stent runs, ruling these things out. When you're able to provide a prescription of how to use it, I think it's e easily adopted. And it's um, most people will then keep it in mind when they're doing a PCI. Riyadh, should, I, I, I should agree. it be a 1A indication? I, yes, I, I think so. I mean, if it was your family member or you yourself on that table, I think you'd want image guidance done. So let's treat everybody like ourselves. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And I, I think, you know, the, the point that has been made about education is well made. And there's a huge resource coming to the, the Boston Scientific Educare uh, website that we add it to on a regular basis. So I would encourage people to please visit that and to make use of it. It's free to access. It's it's very much a measured view. It's not a, a an industry centric and um, biased sort of thing. It's it's just educative. So this is not something that we should be afraid of. It, it's really quite straightforward to learn how to do it. And as I say, you don't need an encyclopedic knowledge of every single picture that's ever been taken and all these weird and wonderful things. To actually put stents in, well, it's a distilled information set, and it's it's a quite a quick set of decisions. I think when we get to the Avigo system and ALA and other things, actually be able to do all of this both before and after stents, probably with three mouse clicks. Uh, and that's not a lot of time out of your day to give your patient a, a huge reduction in repeat revascularization. So I think it's it's a crucial thing. So, so thank you very much for everybody for their attention. Thanks to our two presenters who did a fantastic job. Uh, and we'll, uh, we'll sign off here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.